The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 120. One day, I shall come back. That's it. I've been renewed. It's when a Time Lord's body wears out, he regenerates. I'm a Time Lord. I'm not a human being. I walk in eternity. Brave hearty. Change, my dear. And it seems on a moment too soon. Unlimited vice pudding! Position that's wearing a bit thin. Fantastic. Allons-y! I am Scottish. I can complain about things. Ta-da! She'll be fine. Hi, I'm Don Bethanelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're continuing our discussion of the two-parter that began last week with Human Nature and continues with Family of Blood, featuring David Tennant as the 10th Doctor. Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Folks, uh, as, as I usually do, uh, take a moment to the beginning here to remind you to like The Secrets of Doctor Who on Facebook, to retweet the show on Twitter, leave us comments. If you have not done so yet, please subscribe. You can do so on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, tune in your favorite podcast app or YouTube where you should hit the bell to get notifications. And above all, please share the podcast with your friends and family to help us grow our community and reach more listeners. And I want to continue for, from last week when I asked for some uh, volunteers for SQPN. If you know anything about audio editing, uh, websites using WordPress, uh, just knowing how to post things, even um, if you want to help us with social media, you want to help us with organizing the shows behind the scenes, you know, keeping track of feedback and of different participants and that sort of stuff. We're looking for help. So if you could send us, if you're interested at all, I can, we can have a longer conversation over email or, or whatnot. Um, send me an email to help at sqpn.com and let us know that you're interested in giving us a little help. It's not it's not a huge commitment. Um, whatever you can do, we would love for your help. And and you don't even have to be in the U.S. because, you know, Internet. Internet. In fact, if you're uh, working halfway around the world, uh, maybe working off hours uh, compared to us would be good. I mean, we have a show all the way from uh, Australia, The Catholics of Oz, which is gr a great show. And it works great, you know, because Internet. Uh, time you want me. So we're in the second part of this uh, episode from the third season, featuring Martha Jones as companion, um, aired in June 2007, just a place in time for you. And we're continuing with the doctor who has become human to hide from some aliens. And uh, his and he's human to John Smith. So so the previous episode, and Previously. this is based on the novel <laughs> Human Nature. Yes. Uh, but in in as the title suggests, you know, by becoming human, the doctor holds up a mirror to human nature, which is really what this is about. It's like, what would he be like if he wasn't a Time Lord? What if he was an ordinary human? How would that affect him? And it's kind of unflattering. Um, you know, he does have likable qualities. He is kind of this bumbling, shy professor, but he's also more militaristic and harder edged and less compassionate. And so it's kind of an interesting is he's recognizable in some ways, but he's different in some ways. And it's so it's kind of, you know, holding up a mirror to us as humans saying here, are, here are some weak spots. Um, Dom, you had a question in the previous episode where uh, you were wondering, like, OK, in order to hide from them, he has to become human biologically. But why does he need to lose his memories? And <clears throat> I, I went and I checked the transcript and uh, of this episode. And obviously, he it's implied he needs to become a human biologically or the family of blood can sniff him out um, because they can detect him, his bi Time Lord biology across space and time. So he says every cell in his body needs to be rewritten. But why would that involve losing his memories? They don't say this, but during the break, I was thinking about, between when we recorded these episodes, I was thinking about um, that, and it could be they can also, because there's a telepathic component to all of this, they may be able to detect his uh, his his mind 
across space and time as well. And so he'd need to alter that. The problem is, again, with time travel and hunting across time, why do they need to get him at this moment in his timeline? Why right. not snatch him elsewhere? Right. Right. They could show up before he even knew they existed and grab him. Yeah, it's a it, that is a real plot hole that that you you create by having a time travel show. So, yeah, <laughs> at least if time can be rewritten, well, then rewrite him and go back to an earlier point in his time and grab him there. Right. So in this episode, we have the one of the major parts of it is this conflict between John Smith and the doctor, the John, the doctor becoming this John Smith human guy who realizes that he has to, in a way, die in order to re- become the doctor again and save everyone. And we have this... That becomes the big moral crisis of this episode, is he does he likes being John Smith. He does not want to become this mysterious doctor person he doesn't even remember. It's, it's, it, it's very much like situations in other episodes where, especially in recent times, where he doesn't want to regenerate. Right. Well, and that's something I wanted to bring up, which is, is they make it sort of like a form of suicide that John Smith would be giving up his life for in order to become the doctor. He would, and and the tenth doctor especially would go on to view regeneration the same way. Uh, so um, he, in fact, he aborts a, a regeneration in process to keep his current bu- body and to not answer the call of Ood Sigma when it came time for his eventual regeneration prolonging that time until he he finally can't avoid it at, at, at the end, uh, literally the end of time, which is the name of the episode, and and has to regenerate. So th- this I think this episode has this, is supposed to have this profound effect on how the Doctor review, views regeneration uh, and changing uh, from this point mm-hmm. on, which is interesting. He, he also, via retcon, resisted regeneration another time when he avoided becoming the Metacrisis Doctor. And he actually did regenerate, but kept the same face because he couldn't bear becoming another person. Which one was that? Well, was that's the, where he, it's uh, it's where he gets the stolen earth, where he gets shocked by or shot by the Daleks and regenerates and channels some of the regeneration energy off into the hand that becomes the Meta Crisis Doctor. But then later on, Matt Smith reveals, no, that was a full regeneration. I'm the last one. I just had personality issues and kept the same face at the time. Okay. All right. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. Yes. But but and and this creates an interesting dramatic situation on a on a meta level because we as the audience, while it might be nice to see the Doctor as John Smith temporarily, ultimately as the audience, we want the Doctor back. But put yourself in John Smith's perspective, and it's like you have all your life believed you're whoever you are. Let's say Dom Bettinelli. And one day somebody shows up and says, you're not you at all. You're a delusion. And you now, in order to save everybody, you have to give up everything you think you are, Dom, including your family, which is here in in the form of Joan Redfern. Um, And you've got to subjectively die so that this other you can be reborn and save everybody. That would be terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we've seen this this same concept in other science fiction. And Star Trek had a version of this when Captain Picard. Uh, it, it's not exactly the same thing, but he lived a whole life as you know, as someone else in his mind, you know, uh, and had to kind of give that up at the end. I mean, there's been we've seen this. Yeah, that's sort the of, episode. That's the episode. Inner light. Inner light. Yes. Which, which uh, that's one of my one of my favorites. Next gen is that particular one. I like yes, that one. It's universally uh, beloved by by fans. I think. Um, so we, we let's get back to the uh, to the story that we you previously on Doctor Who. Uh, we, we had we had this standoff in the uh, d- at the dance in the village, uh, and uh, we have a it used to be called but the only Mexican- on but only on one night, so it's a one night standoff. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> no, no, so for people who may not know, pre nineteen seventies when one night stand came to mean something else, a one night stand was a one night dance or musical event where you'd set up the stand for one night and have the musicians and the performers perform. And that was the one night stand. Right. And then, yeah, that does I, as, I, as everything. I, this, I do no, those the 60s ruined everything. I, I, I do. I do those all the time, except today they're called dance parties. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
So, um, so one time you, they would call this a Mexican standoff, but I think that's not appropriate anymore. So it, <laughs> maybe that's not what it is anymore. But it's the standoff where the, 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 the pistols are pointed in all directions and nobody wants to pull a trigger. Um, and at, at this point, Tim distracts the, the family, Tim Latimer, the, the young boy. Uh, he briefly opens the watch, which makes them all freak out because they could smell the doctor's essence. Um, and that lets Ma- uh, Martha turn the tables on Mother. And then um, and and Martha takes charge and it's like, get these people out of here. Doctor, you take Redfern and get her out of here. And Martha is the adult in the room at this point. Right. And uh, at one point, uh, the, Tim rejects the doctor. Uh, the doctor you know, tries to, you know, to, you know, or John Smith tries to take you have Tim come with him. And he says, no, you're as bad as them. He like he for whatever his experiences of what's going on with this watch. He's af- as afraid of the doctor as he is of the, yeah. the family of blood. He, in Through the Watch, he's seen the doctor as the oncoming storm, as this figure of fire and terror and stuff to some people. Also, the doctor last episode authorized an upperclassman to give him a beating. Yeah. So there's kind of that. That like, doesn't it, help matters either. Yeah. yeah. I could. I, I like that teacher. Uh, I like Martha. Like you said, she takes charge. She yells at him. Don't just stand there. Run. God, you're rubbish as a human. Which, yeah. <laughs> a great moment. <laughs> um, so it is a good thing this school oh, is. All, yeah. Also, I wanted to compliment because there's this moment at the dance, and it may actually be in the end of the previous episode, but there's this moment in the dance um, where Martha realizes Jenny has become mother of mine. And we get a Martha point of view shot of Jenny and the family of blood with mother of mine walking towards her, talking about what it was like for Jenny to be to be possessed by her and and how there was all that screaming and she like waggles her face and smiles and says screaming joyously yeah, and it's right. just such a creepy moment right exactly yeah it is effectively creepy um so they run back to the school and which is it's lucky that the school is uh, built like a fortress so they can they can hold out against a, a uh, an army of scarecrows um the doctor calls everyone to arms and the headmaster um, you know what's going on here, and he and he tells them, and then uh, he he ends up going out to confront Baines outside the gates with an, another teacher, the the red shirt in this <laughs> this moment, um, who who tells him of the war that is coming. He says, "War is coming in foreign fields, war of the whole wide world, with all your boys falling down in the mud. Do you think they'll thank the man who taught them it was glorious?" Uh, it's a very uh, profound line, and then um, the the assistant teacher the the teacher the headmaster is, is still clueless about what's really going on um until Baines shoots this the red shirt teacher and disintegrates him <laughs> which but he runs for his life um so and at this at this point the the heroism of the students in this apparently military school that they forgot to tell us was a military school um starts to become apparent as the as the boys start responding to deal with the situation based on their training and there is a kind of even though we're going to have big pacifist elements in this um in this um uh, episode like the the will they thank the man who taught them this was glorious there's also a recognition of the competence and the need for the boys to have these skills as tragic as the oncoming world war 1 is these guys are doing their part and they don't know it yet, but they're doing something that, you know, the mistakes are kind of made at the level of leaders, but uh, you know, that brought on the war, but these boys are doing something that does have nobility to it. Right. Right. And it, and it's proven um, to, 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 to be so. So uh, there is a, a moment where um, Joan confronts Smith slash the doctor about you know they're just boys. How can you ask them to fight? And and he he basically says, um, I had it here. Uh, you know, they're cadets, Miss Jones. They're trained to defend the king and all his citizens and properties. Uh, you know, the, there's this this very strong like and Martha's objecting. You can't do this, Doctor Mister Smith. She she does the same thing I end up doing, which is <laughs> trying to remember who he's supposed to be at the moment. Um. <clears throat> And that's when the headmaster comes in and he says, before I devise an excellent and endless series of punishments for each and every one of you, someone explain very simply and immediately what exactly is going on. And that's when we have this. We're under attack. And then we have this moment where he goes out to confront Baines. Um, he does say something and I missed in that 
confrontation with Bane. So he says, uh, oh, Bane's and one of the cleaning staff. I should have known there's always a woman involved. <laughs> He's just yes. asking to be disintegrated. So we, so we have racism, classism, and now sexism. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, so... I, I like Bane's response to that. And he does it a couple of times where he goes, he's kind of mocking this, you know, yes, sir, yes, sir, attitude. Headmaster, sir, good evening, sir. Come to give me a caning, sir. Would you like that, sir? He just <laughs> right. rapid fire off the, you know, the sir, 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 sir. Oh, yes. And then they had sent the little girl in because, of course, she's a little girl. So she won't be able to come in the fr- through the front door fighting. So, you know, sneak your way in through a, through a back door, they tell her. Um, so then we have the disintegration of the uh, the, the other teacher. Um, now, meanwhile, Martha has to... And, per- and, a, and a huge, unbelievable number of scarecrows shows up. Yes. Like we said before, in the last time, uh, every scarecrow in England has been turned into a, a warrior for... The, well, uh, and, and then they, then they, he, the son of mine, Baines, says that he pretty much he used some kind of, you know, future tech. Three, like you said, Dom, last episode, 3D printing, basically, to create the scarecrows. They weren't uh, actual scarecrows that had been animated, but that he had created them. Yeah, maybe it was some of both. Maybe they animated the first one and then then Xeroxed it. Yes, yeah, that could be. So uh, Martha is in the study, frantically searching for the watch uh, in order to turn the doctor back into the doctor. I, I love it as she's explaining to Joan Redfern, the, the matron, what's going on. And she uses the word alien. And another nice bit of, you know, linguistically historical thing alien means not from abroad i take it which of course <laughs> was the normal meaning as just a person from another country right he's uh from another he's born in another world and then martha has to prove that she's a doctor like say i'm not just following him around i'm trying i'm trying to be a doctor and she's like oh that's nonsense women might train to be doctors but hardly one of your color he says and hardly a skivvy oh, yes. which i think is a class term uh it's skivvy i think so yeah but uh, so and then so Martha says, oh, and then rattles off all of the bones of the hand. <laughs> you read that in a book, she says. Well, yeah, <laughs> duh. <laughs> yes, to pass my in exams. My medical textbooks. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so the, we, uh, then we have um, uh, Joan event does confront Smith uh, on his background. Like, where are you from, really? Tell me about the place you live. Tell me about... And all he can repeat are the dry facts of his legend uh, that the that the TARDIS provided him with. The mm-hmm. he legend has no, is no vivid, no vivid childhood memories to draw he, upon. He basically re- repeated Wikipedia is what he did. Exactly. And uh, and he thinks that Joan is pining for the romantic idea of the doctor as opposed to this, you know, country professor at a small boarding school um, and, you know, sort of throws that back at her. Um, <clears throat> meanwhile, Latimer and and Joan gets irrationally pacifist. Yes, yes. Uh, maybe a little rational, given that her husband died in war. So. Yeah, no, 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 no. You it, it, you can lose a spouse, even under tragic circumstances, and mourn that, and still say there are times where violence has to be used. Right, right. I mean, I, when, I suppose in this when, case, yeah. When when you have your school is being besieged by people disintegrating other people. That's one of the times that defending yourself, even with lethal force, is fully justified. Right, right. And given that you're, what, what are you shooting at? Is scarecrows? I mean, who yeah. are you really I mean, killing? There, there's a saying, which I'm sure the, uh, Father Corey as a military chaplain has heard, which is there are no atheists in foxholes. Well, there are also no pacifists in foxholes. And they're <laughs> in a foxhole right now. Joan is being irrational. Right. So Latimer is is out in the courtyard with Hutchinson, the who the the schoolboy who gave him the beating earlier, but who he's also seen in a future vision, in you know in World War One, apparently about to get, getting killed in in battle. They're out in the courtyard piling up sandbags, and uh, Latimer says, um, you know, he, he realizes we we both survived this because he he knows because it's in the future, um, and says maybe I was given this watch so I could help. He's, maybe I stole this watch. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And runs away. Latimer calls him a coward. Uh, you know, Hutchinson calls him a coward. He says, oh, yes, sir, every time. Yeah, um, but he uses it to scare away a uh, daughter of mine. Um, but it also alerts the family to the, that the doctor's consciousness is contained in the watch. So at this point, uh, as I'm watching this, I'm, I'm, I said to myself, it feels like they're trying to make a grand statement about the First World War, the horrors of war. But it doesn't have a clear focus or point. There's sort of this a vague, the, you know, war is hell sort of notion. 
but we've but it's like we've got three different stories going here. We have the hey, what would if the doctor became a human? We have a love story and in a, a a sad love story, and then we have this war story, and and none of them get priority in this. I I think that um I think I mean that didn't bother me. To me, that's all part of one thing because what they're saying to us <clears throat> is since this is all about what is human nature war seems to be intrinsic to human nature and um and that means we're going to have human nature leads to war and war leads to personal tragedy like sacrificing romances and lives and so i i view it as part of a logical progression um and uh, for me, the interesting thing is, you know, there's very much a pacifist culture at the BBC in terms of what line this show should take. But there's also a um, uh, you don't diss what people did in, to, you know, save the country in World War One. Armistice Day is a huge thing in England. And and so there's there's also a so there's kind of a cultural mandate for pacifism in the management of this show. But there's also a cultural mandate for respecting uh, World War One and what British soldiers did during it. And those two mandates clash. And so the episode has this kind of uncomfortable tension that doesn't fully resolve between those two things. And, you know, um, while I think that in later episodes, especially in the most recent season, they take the pacifism to ridiculous extremes. Um, here, I think they get the balance about right. I don't know that I'd strike it exactly this way, but World War I was a huge, unnecessary tragedy brought on by the mistakes that were made by um by the secret treaties that the different european nations had and so forth that uh and and the ideals of the time and it was a huge unnecessary tragedy but at the same time there was something done on the on the lower level on the level of individual soldiers and military men and women the few there were at the time and mostly nurses that was genuinely um admirable and that deserves commemoration. And so you, you do have this complex human situation here that grows out of human nature. Well, it also, there's also the recognition, I think, of, you know, yeah, pacifism is a wonderful ideal. But at best, it's an ideal when the enemy is standing at the gates, literally in the case of this, this <laughs> episode. Yeah. But, you know, you can think of, OK, maybe World War One was not the greatest example of, of that. But World War Two certainly was. And, in, you know, especially in Britain, where they're literally being bombed flat by someone who wants to conquer them, you know, and there weren't a lot of pacifists during World War II in Britain because they knew that this was literally life or death. Either they fight back or they die. Right. And there was no middle ground. Right. So uh, speaking of uh, the enemy at the gates, we have um, straw men. <laughs> by the way, enemy literally. at the gates, or maybe it's enemy at the doors, is a fascinating British period piece about World War II as seen from the island of Guernsey, because it was occupied by the Nazis. And so there's this fascinating, complex series from the 70s that you can watch on Amazon about um, what it's like to live under Nazi occupation in the British island of Guernsey. Yes. Uh, also, it's kind of kind of like prequel to Man in the High Castle. There was a recent book that was turned into a movie or miniseries, the Guernsey Potato Pie and Literary Society, I think it's called. Uh, something like that, which is about that same thing. Uh, the people living under the the, the German occupation. So uh, what's that? There's also, if you want to talk about Enemy at the Gates, there was the movie early early 2000s about the Battle of Stalingrad. It's yes. also called that. Yes, which was fascinating. Uh, so anyway, that's not uh, this one, though. Uh, so we have straw men attacking the, the yeah. castle, and it is not a commentary on social never, media. Never <laughs> attack straw men. Yes. Uh, although I, I, I have to wonder... How hard can a a a, a, a yeah. scarecrow hit a gate? Because <laughs> you're made of straw. Apparently enough to crack a, a solid four by four metal or four by four wood beam. Yeah. Yes, apparently. I, I, I think these are reinforced scarecrows, like they've got yeah. rebar in there or something. Well, I was yeah. wondering, like, <laughs> why do the bullets affect the scarecrows at all? I mean, you're just I know, hitting no vital straw. organs, no nervous <laughs> you know, system. I, the way the way I, I 
kind of figured it is it, it was a trick by the, the family of blood because of course then they regenerate the scarecrow haulers regenerate and their scarecrows all come back to life anyways right. and you've wasted all your bullets so that's yeah. true well the doctor we, if you'll notice he never fires his gun he's sort of he'll season yeah. horror as it comes and he never actually pulls the trigger um, and he here. and he wimps out on dealing with the little girl because yes. broadcast standards <laughs> right yep. They they send in the little girl because they they the family blood knows that no one will shoot her because she's a little girl. The headmaster, clueless, tries to save her and ends up, you know, he's getting disintegrated. dying for his trouble. Yep. Um, Tim here shows that he's anything but cowardly because he uses the watch to draw off the bad guys when they're threatening other boys uh, that he see, he encounters. Um, I I noticed one thing here. John Smith has a lot fewer funny quips in the face of danger. Uh, the, the difference in the personality than the doctor. You know, this, uh, the, it, he's much more just scared and running for his life uh, and and not stopping to, Which, to be funny. You know, it it, it definitely uh, shows kind of the human side of, of, of this character where, you know, they're, they're uh, obviously they're making him so that he hasn't fought. You know, he, he's inexperienced in warfare, but he's teaching at the school where he has to learn. Right. Yes, it, which is interesting. So apparently the the John Smith legend that the TARDIS has created has, is not a war veteran. Correct. Yeah, and and now we're really getting the high, starting to get the high drama of his identity crisis because Martha is like, we need the doctor, and he's, I'm John Smith, that's all I want to be, and he's weeping. Right, right. Um. So, yes, uh, the scarecrows, because the scarecrows have moved the TARDIS to the school. They're trying to draw him out of the woods where he's hiding with Martha and Joan. And and John Smith says, "I'm I'm not the Doctor. I'm John Smith. That's all I want to be. John Smith with his life and his job and his love. Why can't I be John Smith? Isn't he a good man?" And that's that's sort of that's really the heart of this conflict, internal conflict that we're seeing here in this episode. There's also a nice bit where he's talking to Martha about why he travels and stuff and hasn't and and she makes the comment that he's the he the doctor is lonely. That's why he and, has her. Right. Yeah, and and that's why he has a companion and he says and that's what you want me to become. Right. That's that's uh, that's the hard like how yeah, how do you answer that? Yeah, you have to you have to become this tragic figure because the because the world and the universe need you. So I, yeah, I, no, so this was a tactical mistake on Martha's point. The correct answer at this moment is not because he's lonely. It's because we're friends. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah, you think that? <laughs> uh, this is the point where I, I made a, a note where I said, uh, what, you know, how many people died because Tim took the watch and held on to it? Yeah. Yeah. And that's exactly that's, that, that we we'd mentioned that before last week's episode. And at this point, the family of blood, since the TARDIS bringing the TARDIS hasn't worked, they up the to the game to the next level and they start using space artillery to shell the village and destroy the village and they're killing who knows how many people right right now tim says well, you know when confronted you know why have you you had the watch all this time and why didn't you return it he says because it was waiting so he says the watch he claims the watch told him to wait but mm -hmm. he admits and because i was scared of the doctor uh because i've seen him and so John Smith here sees the restoration of the doctor as a as an execution of him. Um, it's like a type of regeneration. In fact, we've seen the doctor react, not just this doctor, but other uh, versions of the doctor react to regeneration the same way that they're going. They'll survive, but not but it won't be me. Right. And that's an interesting perspective here, because, again, John Smith is like a a, a regeneration of the doctor. He is. You know, he is the, the 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 an incarnation of the doctor who will go away, but still be him. And so it's an interesting perspective. And it's Joan who is the one. Uh, Martha's arguments are don't carry any weight, but it's Joan is the one one who convinces him. And the, even when the doctor says, but he won't love you. And and yet, you know, she says, yes, because and what convinces him is they get a vision of the life they would have led together all the way to his eventual death from old age. Where did so that this come is, from? This is the last temptation of Doctor Who. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wondered, is this, is, this a, is this a temptation or a gift? Like, 
okay, you're not going to get to live a life together. So here is a memory of that life that you can carry with you. Yeah, I, I think, think that, that's kind of how I took it. That's kind of how I took it, though, of, you know, this is this is what could be. And you get to experience it to just even that little taste, if you will. The, the message is that I think it, the doctor has grand heroic adventures, but he can never live that ordinary heroic life that they saw. There's there's another nice bit where the where John Smith doesn't realizes something he doesn't like about the doctor. And he says falling in love didn't even occur to him. What sort of man is that? <laughs> right. In the, mm. in the list of things to, you know, Martha to, to watch out for. Right. And and in all of this, he's so emotional. He's so on the verge of tears, basically. Uh, I had to give David Tennant props. I mean, so well done here. Well done. Oh, yes. So then we have the Doctor showing up in um, the spaceship of the Family of Blood uh, as Bumbling John. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that everyone except the Family of Blood knew that... As he's that, hitting every button on the yeah, wall. Yeah, that this was actually the Doctor pretending and... to be human still, yes. It's very implausible. I mean, someone comes into my house and starts typing on my computer, and I don't think that's suspicious. You know, <laughs> right. and it's like, okay, I know what these devices do. Yeah, hey, stop hitting that. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is a, a oh, he's uh, what did they say? He's still human. He didn't just make himself human. He made himself an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good line. Uh, and then uh, Bane says, uh, d same thing, isn't it? So, yeah, they uh, don't like us very much. If it was so easy to fool their sense of smell mm -hmm. uh, and, not, and not see him, why didn't he do this in the first place? Uh, uh, yeah, good yeah. question. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, you know, OK. I mean, you can argue it's because of the watch he's got there and stuff. Right. Maybe. But then we're told, you know, why did why was he running from them in the first place? And he says, I was being kind. So yeah. as not to do to them what I would have to do. This, and then he this is a, getting back into the blustery doctor where, oh, he could have snapped his finger and the family of blood would have been gone. But, oh, yeah. I'm going to give them a chance. And this is a, a trend that will ultimately be played out in the Matt Smith era. <clears throat> um, and it's also it's in A Christmas Carol where where Kazrin Sardik is uh, the doctor has appeared to him or the doctor and Amy have appeared to him twice as the ghosts of Christmas past and present. And, and he's talking to Amy and is like, you know, why is he doing this? Why is he doing it this way? He's trying to be kind because he could get harsh. And, mm -hmm. but this is definitely the doctor in I'm the oncoming storm mode. Yep. And this doesn't really ring credible um, well, he, because he was so scared Right. In that opening sequence of the throne of blood, it's not, I'm so scared I'm going to have to imprison these people for all eternity. Well, he does yeah. what, what he does to them is like, it's not just bad. I mean, these people were about to die of old age anyway, right? And so what he, what he does is he imprisons them in such a way that they are not going to die. They're going to suffer for eternity. Like yeah, he exactly. basically condemns them to hell. Uh, that he that didn't goes too have far. to do that. He could just let yeah. them die. Yeah, it's very like that. That was very uncomfortable uh, moment here, like imprisoning the girl in in the mirrors and every mirror, which is very every creepy. Yeah, very so, creepy. Yeah. Right. Every, every time you see something out of the corner of your eye, that's mm -hmm. her. Yeah. It's the little girl. <laughs> or the in the event horizon of the of a black hole, or all these other things. It's just uh, that it was ex excessive is the word I think I wanted to use there. So I think it was really cool, but I don't think this story set it set us up for it properly because they I mean, the the whole motive of the family is they want to live. They don't like the fact they've got a three month lifespan like mayflies, he says. And so they need to consume a time lord so they can live further. OK, and that warrants eternal punishment. I mean, on a did, administered by not human, but mortal justice here in this I mean, world. Right. You think it would have been easy for them to write it where the doctor imprisons them somehow, or as they're, you know, kind of that last stand and you see them dying and Oh, your time's up. Right. It could have been like that or just imprison them for the rest of their natural life, which would have been about three weeks. You yeah. know, that, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. All I know is that some, some English farmer is going to get quite a surprise when he's clearing out the old scarecrows in his field and he finds no beans kidding. inside of one of them. That would be a little creepy. He invites, uh, now he's the doctor, he's no longer uh, John, and he invites Joan to travel with him to try again at falling in love. 
which is an interesting idea, which the, with, if Martha's still there, awkward. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you think? Also, yeah. also, at this point, Martha has confessed her love to the doctor and said she hopes he doesn't remember it once the watch is fully open. Right. And that is which, not dealt with. Yeah. Yeah, well, no, it kinda, is eventually. No, no, no. It, it, it does mention at the end that he does remember it. Oh, well, I, right. I just said it's, anything it's to in. get you to come back. Right. Yeah. That's true. That's true. But Joan rejects the, the proposals because John Smith is dead, even though the doctor says he's inside him somewhere. Yeah, he says, John Smith is dead and you look like him. Right. Then she, she's like, yeah, okay, I wouldn't want to be with this guy that's dead but has the same body. And then she really throws it in his face, which is just one question. If the doctor had never visited us, if he'd never chosen this place on a whim, would anybody here have died? <laughs> he doesn't yeah. answer. So she says, you can go. Yes. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was harsh. <laughs> oh, man. So and that, at the same time, bittersweet undercurrents, because we know the affection they had for each other. Right, oh, yeah. right. And then there's some part of the doctor that was really affection, you know, infection with her and in, in falling in love with her. So the, the doctor ends up leaving the watch with Tim, which is no longer, you know, special, aside from being a Gallifreyan watch, which is kind of cool. I wouldn't mind having one hint, hint for birthday presents. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the, the, Tim says he knows what must be done, thinking of dying in the war. But it turns out the watch actually saves Tim on the battlefield because yep. he sees Context. the time. <laughs> sees the time, knows what's happening, and pushes himself in Hutchinson, who the big jerk, saves the jerk who beat him. Uh, to the yep. side. Yeah. So previously we'd seen the line it, it, with them looking at the watch. It's time as the bomb is about to drop on them. And now it's time to the right. And they <laughs> leap out of the way. Right. Yep. <laughs> uh, how old is Tim here? Do you think? Uh, well, he's a year Maybe early teens. And, and, yeah. He's like, really? I mean, he, he's, he's quite young. I think 14, 15, I, 14, 15, I think. Not, yeah. Not, not very plausibly soldier age but now i mean if he would have been let's know. say 15 at the time of this episode then he would have been 16 at the time of the war a year later and that was definitely not unheard of of 16 year olds enlisting S sneaking their way in yeah All also right. uh it's nice to note in the scene in the follow-up context scene we get tim is now in command He's the superior officer over the bully who had previously uh, abused him in school. Right. He says, come on, that's an order. Hutchinson's like, leave me. I'm not going to make it. No, I'm not leaving you. Uh, well, he says, didn't I promise you all those years ago? So maybe it's more than like maybe more than a year later. Maybe it's several years. Interesting. So we end with, um, you know, now many years in the future, Tim uh, is an elderly man in a wheelchair. Um, and a, a vicar is reading at an Armistice Day uh, observance a poem called For the Fallen by Lawrence Binion, um, which has an interesting line in it that says, uh, which you may sound familiar, they shall not grow old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not wear them, nor the years contemn. Which is an interesting double meaning here for the doctor, isn't it? Because uh, the doctor doesn't grow old, at least as, as we grow old. Uh, which is an interesting idea. Um, Given the age, I'm guessing this is not 2007, because uh, by now, Tim would have been long gone. Uh, this was an issue, for, I mean, a minor thing, but um, but it, I had an issue with this, because based on Tim's age in this, yeah. it, this service, sh this Armistice Day sh service should have been taking place like in the 1950s or the 1960s at the latest, and the vicar is a woman, well, which now... Se I think the, 70s or 80s. I mean, he's an elderly man in a wheelchair. Now, 1913, right. Tim would have been around 14. So Yeah, but no, he had to be born around 1900 or earlier, 1890s. Right. So he right. looked so like he, he would have been in 70s or 80s. Okay, still, I think it's early for a, for a female now, vicar in now, the Church of England. Here's, here's a hint. The book <laughs> she's carrying, I, look, I looked it up online. It's called The Alternative Service Book 1980. Uh, hmm. Okay. So it has okay. to be after 1980. So, so even in his eighties, uh, in the nineteen eighties, a, a, a lady vicar would be unusual, certainly unusual, yeah. but not unheard of at that no, point, right? Depending mm -hmm. on what part of the eighties it would have been, right? But, uh, but it's interesting that the poem itself is uh, is actually a, a, a quite good memorial uh, for sol fallen soldiers, yep. and, and I, yeah, he, I recommend it. Actually, I'll, I'll 
I remember to put a link in the he, show notes to it because he wrote a, it like in September of 1914. So it was just right after World War One had started and it became synonymous with Memorial of World War One. That's why it's, it's read at those memorial services. So the, the doctor does not grow old, but the years do weary him. So, mm-hmm. uh, so any uh, any other notes on this episode, guys? Is there anything I, I haven't covered? I had two small ones. Um, one is when the family of blood is talking to itself. I mean, you have a member in one place and another member in another place. They do something that's either telepathy or mechanical telepathy. And I, I like the, the and they'll talk to each other across distances. But the way they do it, I find visually very nice. All they do is they look slightly up and a green light shines on their face. And that tells us they're in communication mode and they never say anything about this. They never explain it, but it's just a visually striking way for the for the filmmakers to to signal this is a special state that's allowing them to communicate. And I like that. It's just very subtle. I like that. Also, uh, you know, I can't help but thinking of things through a linguistic historical perspective. And Joan, at one point has a line where she's talking about how someone has been disintegrated. But because this is 1913 and she hasn't read all this science fiction where disintegration is the common word for what's happened, she says they were vanished. And and normally um, I'm used to that usage, vanished as a transitive verb uh, in, in the context of magic, in stage magic, If you make something disappear in layman's terms, you vanish it. And 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 so it was neat to see this parallel construction used in a historically believable way as a substitute for what normally in science fiction would be called a disintegration. Interesting. Yes. Yep. So no disintegrations. (laughs) No disintegrations. Thank you, Lord Vader. Uh, Father Corey. (laughs) (laughs) Nothing for me. Okay. Excellent. So uh, before we finish up, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who. Um, And today we're thanking by name Chris, John D., Joseph F., Ronald S., and Austin T. Through their generous donations and those of all of our patrons at sqpn.com slash give, they make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows we do at SQPN. You can join them if you'd like by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Any amount that you can give is greatly appreciated and helps us to continue what we do. So that's and it. For- don't, don't forget to volunteer by emailing help at sqpn.com. Yes, please. Thank you for remembering that. That's it from us. So what did you think of Family of Blood and Human Nature, this two-part story, and what we had to say about it? So let us know by visiting sqpn.com and putting a note on our show notes there or on the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page. You can send an email to Who at sqpn.com. Uh, and you will be back next time when we'll be discussing the sixth Doctor story, Vengeance on Varos. Until then, Father Ooh. Corey Steeketh, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. My pleasure, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember... He's like fire and ice and rage. He's like the night and the storm in the heart of the sun. He's ancient and forever. He burns at the center of time and he can see the turn of the universe. And he's wonderful. Right. This is going to be fun.